Hello everyone, my name is Philip Diane, and I'm here from Cornell Tech to talk to you about front-running and consensus instability in blockchain decentralized exchanges. By this point, we've all heard the promises of the blockchain revolution. Born amid the 2008 financial meltdown, blockchains and cryptocurrencies promise to revolutionize financial transactions by providing a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of digital cash that can be used to create programmable agreements. One of the systems set to be revolutionized by this style of agreement is exchanges. Traditionally, when parties wish to exchange assets, they go to a centralized clearinghouse such as the New York Stock Exchange that promises to execute their trades in order and fairly. Using a blockchain, you can replace this centralized operator with a smart contract or program that executes on the blockchain. This promises to be fairer and more transparent, with no centralized third-party operator required and less potential for such operators to abscond with user funds. So what would such an exchange look like in practice? Consider here Alice and Bob coming together on the Ethereum blockchain, with Alice in possession of one ETH token and Bob in possession of one BBT, or Bob's Bubble token. To signal her intent to trade, Alice posts a cryptographically signed order to an off-chain server. Once this order is posted, Bob can simply see this intent to trade and take this data to the blockchain, providing the funds required for the other side of the trade and completing an atomic swap between Alice and Bob, where Alice is credited her tokens and Bob is credited his ether. After this transaction is confirmed and executed on the blockchain, Alice has her Bob's bubble token balance and Bob has his ether. This seems great. It can achieve the trust and exchange blockchains are designed for, prevent assets from being stolen by any operator by requiring all swaps to be atomic or all or nothing. It's accessible to everyone because no permissioned access control is required on who can see orders or post data to the blockchain. It's transparent because everyone can see what orders are executed. But is it fair? Consider the scenario where Alice makes a typo and accidentally offers 10 ETH for her Bob's Bubble token, way too high of a price. Normally, what you would expect during the operation of such a trade is Alice to notice this mistake and immediately go to the DEX contract, asking to cancel the transaction. If this transaction is successfully cancelled, Bob can then not execute the transaction against the DEX contract. But what if instead of another user, Bob was a bot? Well, then Bob could immediately notice Alice's typo and offer to pay more money in transaction fees than she does for her cancellation, which must be posted to the blockchain to impact the DEX contract. By offering to pay more transaction fees than Alice, Bob gets his transaction in first and manages to scoop up Alice's typo before she can correct it with a cancellation, profiting off of Alice's mistake. Unfortunately, Bob is not alone in this. What we will show in this talk is that a whole ecosystem of bots like Bob compete on the blockchain, bidding up transaction fees in order to attempt to exploit and front-run inefficiencies in decentralized markets and profit from users like Alice. However, typos are just one possible source of arbitrage opportunities and bot revenue. In this work, we consider any trade that is called a pure revenue trade. Those are trades in which bots profit in every single asset that's traded in the transaction. Another source of pure revenue trades is shown here. If one decentralized exchange has multiple orders that cross in the order book, so that one order is offering to buy something at a higher price than the other off order is offering to sell it, Bots can actually compose multiple orders from the same or from different decentralized exchanges into a single transaction and execute this transaction atomically so that if any trade in this transaction fails, the entire transaction is reverted. This characteristic is unique to blockchains and differentiates blockchain arbitrage from Wall Street arbitrage in which all transactions and trades execute probabilistically. On the left is one example of such a pure revenue transaction. In this transaction, a bot completes two trades on the decentralized exchange token store, labeled here as trade 1 and 2. In the first trade, the bot sells ETH to obtain free coin, at a rate of 1.09 times 10 to the 9th free coin per ETH. In the second trade, some user is looking to sell ETH to acquire free coin, at a rate of 1.66 times 10 to the 8th free coin per ETH. This likely represents a typo, as it is a price that's an order of magnitude higher. As you can see here, by executing both of these typo trades atomically, the bot is able to make a profit of 0.79 ETH and 500,000 free, profiting in every traded asset. This is because blockchain exchanges do not feature automatic settlement of cross-transactions, as centralized exchanges do, and therefore allow bots on-chain to take transactions at any price. 
On the right, we show some measurements of this pure revenue marketplace over time in 2018 and 2019, showing a sustained availability of pure revenue opportunities of about $10,000 per day, a conservative lower bound that we measured. These atomic transactions are not just limited to two DEX trades. Oftentimes, these arbitrage bots can pose multiple, sometimes up to even five or six DEX trades into a single transaction and execute them atomically, profiting in every single traded asset. Our analysis of these markets is not purely theoretical. In August 2017, we released a blog post detailing our experiences writing a trade bot, testing the existence of these opportunities in production. Our bot achieved a 58.3% success rate and captured a profit of $2,500 per day in 2017. Needless to say, we both got comments like these and inspired a number of competing copycat bots. The mechanism these bots use to compete against each other is called Ethereum's replace by fee mechanism. In this mechanism, if a bot issues multiple transactions with the same nonce, only one transaction can be included by Ethereum miners. This is intended to allow users to change their mind about certain transactions, for example offering to pay miners a higher transaction fee for inclusion than they had previously. Bots take advantage of this as we see here in this picture of the orange bot competing against the blue bot. The graph on the top of the page shows the price offered by these bots to the miners over time for execution of their arbitrage transactions. As you can see, in the 15 seconds these bots are competing, they offer ever-increasing transaction execution costs to the miner, and do so dozens of times in only a 15 second interval. So how does the miner decide which bot wins the game? Well here you can see the point of view of the miner, which sees all of these repeated transactions, replacement transactions, issued by the bots over the network sequentially. At some point, the miner is going to gather a bunch of these transactions into a block for submission to the network, otherwise known as forming a block template in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Whenever this block template is formed, the top transaction sent by each bot for inclusion by the miner will be included in the block. Whichever bot offered to pay the higher transaction fee will likely be mined first, as miners wish to encourage this auction to occur, and whichever bot therefore offered to pay this transaction fee when the pool showed the template will win the arbitrage opportunity. It's easy to see the devolution of this game into a latency war. If one bot is able to communicate with the network much faster than another bot, it is more likely to have had the last word whenever a miner samples and chooses transactions for inclusion, and is thus more likely to win the arbitrage opportunity. This encourages bots to compete on network connection speed. Miners' incentives are also modified by this game. If a miner takes too long between when it gathers transactions for inclusion into a block and when it finds a proof-of-work solution on the network creating a valid block, it is leaving on the table all of the profit it could have obtained by sampling later transactions sent by these bots and therefore obtaining higher transaction fees and gas prices. This incentivizes the miner to constantly be refreshing the bundles of transactions on which they are attempting to find a proof-of-work solution, sometimes to absurd extents of even millisecond levels or below. To see these auction dynamics, however, we had to deploy extensive measurement infrastructure consisting of six highly peered Ethereum nodes, tens of thousands of dollars of AWS credit, and over one billion observations on bot behavior across the network, as the vast majority of this data is never written to the chain and is discarded by the network. We now turn to the question of whether there is a stable equilibrium in this market, and what strategies make sense for trading bots entering this market to pursue. On our left, we show our game theoretic model, exec, which models the competition between two strategies, S0 and S1. We also model latencies between both arbitrage bots that are able to see each other's transactions and these arbitrage bots and the miners including transactions in the network. So what do these strategies actually look like? First, we're gonna assign a name to this game. We call this game Priority Gas Auctions because these strategies involve arbitrage bots bidding against one another on what is called gas price, or the transaction execution fee paid to miners in the Ethereum network. In these Priority Gas Auctions, we observe two strategies on the live network. The first type of strategy is what's called the reactive strategy. In this strategy, bots observe the behavior of other bots and choose bids that react to their behavior or estimated behavior. The second class of strategies are referred to as blind strategies. In these strategies, bots do not look at all at the actions of other bots and simply play according to a fixed and pre-programmed strategy. One example of a reactive strategy would be to simply watch what other bots are doing on the network and bid up just slightly more than other bots bid every single time. 
If your internet connection is faster than these other bots, it is likely that when miners sample transactions, your transaction will be the last transaction issued to the miner and will thereby have the highest price winning you the auction. It might, on the other hand, make sense to use a blind strategy if bots expect their latency to other bots to be high. If your latency to other bots is high, then bots may only be able to react to other bots' transactions after these transactions are already stale. Essentially, reactive bots may always be one step behind the competition because they simply can't see transactions on the network fast enough. However, when we perform the game theoretic analysis of these strategies in our model, we show that neither strategy leads to a stable equilibrium over time. Instead, we find a stable equilibrium in what we call a grim trigger strategy, which is a hybrid of both reactive and blind strategies. In this strategy, bots cooperate to try to reduce the amount of money that the miner will make off of each one of them. They do so by playing with a blind strategy in which they continuously simply raise their previous bid by the minimum raise amount or the minimum increment they can add to their previous bid on the network. The reason they do this is because by raising anything more than the minimum amount, they will quickly bid each other up, raising the price of the auction and directing money to miners. To keep the price of the auctions low, the bots form an unofficial equilibrium in which they both play according to their own incentives and bid the auction up as little as possible. Of course, this strategy doesn't work if other bots are willing to come in and simply bid the auction up, which is why we call this strategy the grim trigger strategy because it adds one more contingency. If bots notice that their strategy of blindly simply bidding the minimum amount each time is not effective and other bots on the network are outbidding them, they deploy a nuclear option in which they raise the price of the auction so high that the auction becomes unprofitable for every bot in the network. By keeping this nuclear option in their back pocket, they discourage other bots from bidding anything more than the minimum bid amount and taking profit out of the game. In doing so, bots on the network actually unofficially cooperate not in any coordinated way, but just simply because their incentives line up such that it's more profitable for them to do so. This cooperation is at the expense of the miner, who sees lower transaction fees on the network than they otherwise would if they were taking these arbitrage opportunities themselves. This graph shows our calculated profitability of another bot deciding to play against a grim trigger strategy in a variety of ways. The green and blue curves show the expected profit of a bot that chooses to cooperate and raise their bids by the minimum amount. As you can see, for the vast majority of the auction, this profit remains positive in expectation for an arbitrage opportunity of $1, as we assume here. If a bot instead chooses to deviate, represented here by the yellow and the red curves, its profit is negative for the majority of the auction because it is highly likely that the other bot will be able to notice this deviation and respond by deploying the grim trigger nuclear option. Note that deviation is profitable for a small regime this is if the delay in the network is high, shown here by the yellow curve where the delay is 3 seconds, and the bot that deploys the nuclear option, Grim Trigger Strategy, does not have time to react to the deviation. Because the delays we observe in the real network are relatively small, it is generally the case that cooperation is much more profitable than deviation, and with real parameters we actually observe an equilibrium around cooperation in a Grim Trigger regime. What's really, really, really exciting about this is that this equilibrium is not purely theoretical. Here, we show the median amount bots tend to raise over their previous bid, or the percentage of fee they offer to pay over the previous fee they offer to pay with each new bid in an auction on average. The red dotted line shows the minimum raise in one Ethereum client, and the green dotted line shows the minimum raise in another. This minimum raise is the minimum amount these Ethereum clients will allow a transaction to increase its fee by in order to re-relay this transaction across the network. In some ways, these represent completely arbitrary parameters selected by the devs of these clients as DOS protection mechanisms to prevent the network from being flooded with functionally identical transactions. Nonetheless, you can see as time goes on through 2018 and 2019, all the bots that we are measuring converge onto a strategy of raising exactly this minimum amount of either 12.5 or 15%, likely based on whether they think that the 15% client is required to relay transactions given their network connectivity. It's very rare to see results in the real world like this converging perfectly on a game theoretic model, especially when the game is so unusual, being imperfect information and continuous time, representing a partial all-pay auction where even the loser has to pay some fees for attempted execution, 
and occurring with a probabilistic duration, with the game ending whenever some miner in the network finds a block. In order to allow users to see the effects of these bot wars on their trades, we've released a web dashboard, frontrun.me, where all of the data enumerated in this paper, as well as data from various DEXs and additional graphs, are available for interactive browsing by users. An even more serious security problem, however, lurks beneath the surface, and we call it time bandit attacks after a movie from the 80s. Consider a blockchain with arbitrage opportunities that regularly occur as we describe in this paper. And consider a miner who's mining on top of this blockchain. Normally, a miner should be incentivized to mine on the most recent block it's seen. However, in a time bandit attack, a miner is instead incentivized to rewind the blockchain, attempting a 51% attack in which it steals all of the arbitrage profits of previous bots that have profited off users in the manner we describe. It can then use the profits from these arbitrage attacks to subsidize its own 51% attacks, potentially paying for hash rate rentals from the cloud out of these profits and destabilizing the whole blockchain. This is not just a theoretical threat. Our data shows that this is a major consensus threat to Ethereum today, with many blocks on the network containing arbitrage opportunities that are orders of magnitude higher than the combination of block rewards and transaction fees normally paid to miners for the production of such a block. When a new miner attempts to mine on top of this block, of course it will be incentivized to fork away from this block and redirect these profits to itself, even if its success probability is low. This is because the profits to be made are just so massive. So, this ecosystem of bots and arbitrage we describe is not just a threat to users of decentralized exchanges, but to users of any smart contract on the blockchain. That's because these arbitrage profits represent what we call minor extractable value, or value that a miner is able to redirect to themselves if they rewrite the past order of transactions in the blockchain. This minor extractable value can come from many sources, but in general has the effect of destabilizing network consensus by incentivizing miners to fork each other's blocks to claim this profit. We observe that the volume on decentralized exchanges is much higher than the cost of 51% attack, $1.2 billion versus $56 million US dollars, assuming perfect access to rental hardware. That makes this an extremely realistic threat to Ethereum today. To learn more, please read our paper, Flashboys 2.0, or visit us at init.c3.org where you can read more about our cryptocurrency initiative.